<laughs> so let's get right into our study of God's Word. Second Chronicles chapters 25 and 26 tonight, Lord willing. Very interesting study of two more good kings. So why don't we pray and we'll ask God's blessing on our time together in His Word, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we're really looking to you as the author and the finisher of our faith to minister to us tonight in our time together in your word. Lord, we, many of us, are here after a really hectic week and need for you to keep all of the distractions away so that we can give you our undivided attention. Lord, that's why we're here. We're here because we desire to hear you speak into our lives in and through your word. So Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1, chapter 25. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. That's pretty young. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but, and I wish this but wasn't here, but it says, not with a loyal heart. Uh, we're going to see this uh, ultimately lead to his downfall at the end, but here at the beginning, we have this interesting detail concerning this good king not having a loyal heart in his service to and worship of the Lord. And I suppose you could say that at best he was half-hearted. And that's going to come back to uh, really haunt him, so to speak. He did what was right in the Lord's sight. This makes him one of the only nine good kings in the entire history of Israel. And by the way, none of the kings were from the northern tribes of Israel that were good. Uh, they only had evil kings that did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. It was the southern tribes of Judah that these good kings came from. And we're sadly told that this king... Uh, did not really have his heart uh, in it, as it were. In other words, this king was never really fully devoted to the Lord in the sense that he did not set his heart on doing God's will. G. Camel Morgan had some interesting insight into this. He writes, the root idea of the Hebrew word loyal, as it's translated, is being whole, complete. Imperfection of heart consists in incomplete surrender. Some chamber of the temple is retained for selfish purposes. What it was in the case of Amaziah, we're not told, but the fact remains that notwithstanding the general direction of his life, the whole heart was not set on doing the will of God. This is what Jesus said was the greatest of the commandments. It really sums up the commandments. Loving God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And therein is the great command, and it sums up the law entirely. Verse 3, now it happened... As soon as the kingdom was established for him, that he executed his servants who had murdered his father, the king. However, he did not execute their children, but did as it is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall the children be put to death for their fathers, but a person shall die for his own sin." Now, lest you think this is a, a deja vu all over again from last week in the last chapter when 
Athaliah murdered all of her grandchildren. Uh, this is not at all what Amaziah is doing here. It's not similar in that way. And the reason is, is that we're told it was according to the law in Deuteronomy, which was chiefly for the purpose of removing those who would seek revenge. Amaziah is actually off to a good start here. <laughs> um, it's not going to last very long. Uh, he's actually obeying the command of God and not putting these children to death. This is according to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, where it says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Dads, just saying. Nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. This is the law that is quoted by the chronicler. Verse 5, Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and set over them captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, according to their fathers' houses, throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above, and found them to be 300,000 choice men able to go to war who could handle spear and shield. And then verse 6, he also hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. This is going to prove to be a huge mistake, as we're going to see. But, verse 7, a man of God came to him saying, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the children of Ephraim. But if you go, be gone. <laughs> Just go. <laughs> be strong in battle. Even so, God shall make you fall before the enemy. And here's why. For God has power to help and to overthrow. Oh, wow. <laughs> what is he doing here? Well, it seems that he's hired these mercenaries, that's really what they were, from the northern kingdom of Israel. And if you really think about it, this is actually very strategic and even shrewd. But there's a problem. The problem is, while this may be a smart thing to do militarily, it's a very foolish thing to do spiritually because God simply was not with him. Now, why do I point that out? Because to me, it speaks to how we can err greatly when we opt for that which makes sense at the expense of that which the Lord would have us to do. In other words, this was militarily brilliant, very shrewd, very strategic, but God wasn't in it. And so now, even though this might make all the sense in the world, and it could perhaps grant certain success, the fact remains that God was not going to bless it, and in fact, God would overthrow him. One commentator said it best this way, even though it made military sense for Amaziah to hire and use these troops, according to the word from God, it made no spiritual sense. This is because God has power to help and to overthrow. To fight with God is to receive his help. To fight against him is to have God overthrow you. Listen, one of the things I'm learning in my walk with the Lord is I never want to be where God isn't. I never want to be in a place or do anything, set my foot to do anything that God is not in. And such was the case here. Well, verse 9, then Amaziah said to the man of God, <laughs> only concerned about the money, but what shall we do about the hundred talents which I have given to the troops of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give you much more than this. It says to this unnamed man of God, and we're not told his name, basically this, that he's already invested too much money to back out of this alliance he made in hiring these troops from the northern kingdom of Israel. 
And isn't this man of God's answer to Amaziah interesting? He basically tells him that the Lord is able to give him much more in return if he will but obey the Lord. I think we do err greatly when we make decisions solely based on the economic implications of it. We make huge mistakes when our decisions are based on the financial aspect of it and the ramifications of the financial investment. Thankfully, as we're about to see, Amaziah heeds the word of the Lord from this man of God, and in effect, he chooses God over money. Smart move. <laughs> F.B. Meyer wrote, But you say that you have already entered into so close an alliance that you cannot draw back. You have invested your capital. You have gone to great expenditure, yet it will be better to forfeit these than him. This was the bottom line. He was faced with a choice. Is he going to follow the money, so to speak, or is he going to follow the Lord and obey the Lord? Well, to his credit, he does. Verse 10, so Amaziah discharged the troops that had come to him from Ephraim to go back home. Therefore, their anger was greatly aroused against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. Then, verse 11, Amaziah strengthened himself, and leading his people, he went to the Valley of Salt and killed 10,000 of the people of Seir. Also, the children of Judah, verse 12, took captive 10,000 alive, brought them to the top of the rock, this is pretty graphic, and cast them down from the top of the rock, so that they all were dashed in pieces. But verse 13, as for the soldiers of the army which Amaziah had discharged, so that they would not go with him in battle, in other words, deals off, they raided the cities of Judah from Samaria to Beit Haran, killed 3,000 in them, and took much spoil. What's going on here? Well, we're told that Amaziah sent these troops home, but it seems that he did let them keep the money, but doing so made them very angry, which I believe was because they wouldn't be able to plunder the spoil from war. Oftentimes in that day, that's how they got paid was basically whatever they were able to take by way of a plunder from the spoil of war, that's what they got to keep. So even though they were paid this money, which probably went to the higher-ups within that military structure, uh, they didn't get their full pay, as it were. So I believe this because they took much spoil anyway when they raided the cities of Judah. And here's the thing, this is really the consequence of Amaziah's foolish alliance with these troops in the first place. F.B. Meyer again said it best. He says, the soldiers of Israel committed depredations on their way back. This was the result of the folly and sin of Amaziah's proposal. And then he says this, listen. We may be forgiven and delivered, and yet there will be after consequences which will follow us from some ill-considered act. Sin may be forgiven, but its secondary results are sometimes very bitter. This didn't have to happen. And yes, he pulled out in the end, but the problem is, is that there were already consequences for what he had done. Verse 14, now it was so, after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before them, 
and burned incense to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people which could not rescue their own people from your hand? Think about that. <laughs> what are you doing? This is a, a loose paraphrase translated, what are you thinking? The, you, you are taking their gods, which obviously were not there for them, and you're bringing them back and you're bowing down to them, the very gods that failed the people that you stole those gods from? Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Verse 16, so it was, as he talked with him, that the king said to him, Have we made you the king's counselor? Oh, great response. <laughs> Cease. Why should you be killed? Translated, shut up or you're a dead man. Wow. Then the prophet ceased and said, Okay. And then he says this, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not heeded my advice. Probably goes without saying, but this is where the narrative takes a horrible turn for the worst. And it's really evidenced by Amaziah's arrogance. This man now is full of himself, and he is full of pride, and he has turned now to these false gods, but God. But God is gracious. This is the mercy of God and the grace of God in sending him a prophet to warn him. Never think for a moment that God will not warn you. He will not send many warnings your way. The problem is we blow through them, we blow them off, and like Amaziah, we don't heed these warnings to our own peril. Not only does he not heed it, he actually threatens the prophet who brings him this warning. Amaziah is so blinded by his own pride and arrogance, and pride and arrogance are blinding. He's oblivious to the fact that God is now, because of this, going to destroy him. Now verse 17, Amaziah king of Judah asked advice and sent to Joash the son of Jehahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us face one another in battle. This guy's way too big for his britches, okay? And verse 18, this is interesting, Joash king of Israel sent to Amaziah king of Judah, saying, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son as wife. And a wild beast that was in Lebanon passed by and trampled the thistle. Indeed, you say that you have defeated the Edomites, and your heart is lifted up to boast? You're pretty cocky, little man. Stay home. That's what he says. Stay at home now. Why should you meddle with trouble that you should fall, you and Judah with you? But, verse 20, Amaziah would not heed, for it came from God that he might give them into the hand of their enemies because they sought the gods of Edom. What Amaziah does here is a perfect example. It's textbook. Without exception, someone's pride will always lead that someone to their ultimate destruction in the end. And this is exactly what is going to happen to Amaziah. Even when he's told to stay home and not meddle, lest he fall and all of Judah with him, he still refuses in his blinding pride and arrogance to heed 
God's warning. And we're actually told the reason why, which is that he wouldn't heed because God was going to judge him for seeking the gods of the Edomites. I think it was last week we talked about this. God takes this very seriously. The worship of false gods and certainly the leading of God's people into the worship of these false gods. Verse 21, so Joash king of Israel went out and he and Amaziah king of Judah faced one another at Beit Shemesh which belongs to Judah. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his tent. Then Joash, the king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Jehahaz at Beit Shemesh. And he brought him to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. And he took, verse 24, all the gold and silver, all the articles that were found in the house of God with Abed-Edom, the treasures of the king's house and hostages, and returned to Samaria. Amaziah, verse 25, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Joash, the son of Jehahaz, king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah, from first to last, indeed, are they not written in the book of king, the kings of Judah and Israel? After the time that Amaziah turned away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and killed him there. Then they brought him on horses and buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah. What a tragic end, yeah? What a tragic end to this good king, you know, his downfall really began at the beginning. It began with his half-hearted devotion to the Lord. And the reason being is that when someone's heart is not fully devoted to the Lord, it's only a matter of time before it's going to be fully devoted to something else. And in Amaziah's case, that something else was full of himself. And full of pride. He was so full of himself and as such full of pride that he meddled to his own peril. Uh, as I was preparing for this study tonight, I, I wrote this note because the Lord kind of ministered this to me. And we're going to see it again, sadly, with King Uzziah, his son, in the next chapter in just a moment. But uh, let me say it this way. Pride always propels us into perilous places. Can I say that again? Pride always propels us into perilous places. We're going to see this now with Uzziah. Chapter 26, verse 1. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 year old, years old when he became king and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. That's a long time. His mother's name was Jecolia of Jerusalem and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Uh, uh, enjoy that. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, because then we're going to only get it one more time, uh, Lord willing, next week in chapter 27. Uh, and then after that, it's all downhill. So I uh, don't mean to depress you, but it is what it is. So he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God and I want you to pay particular attention to this last sentence here in verse 5. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Okay. I hope you'll kindly indulge me for just a little bit. I want to share with you 
a letter that was writ written by Pastor Chuck Smith back on October the 15th, 2012. And I do so, I believe, because it's most apropos. Pastor Chuck references verse 5 here in chapter 26 that we just read as it relates to the concerns that he had for the future of the Calvary Chapel movement. Another reason I think it would be appropriate for me to share it is because recently I've been receiving many comments and questions, particularly from online people, asking about what's going on with Calvary Chapel. So I thought it would be very appropriate to read you this letter and share with you what Pastor Chuck had wrote. Dear fellow laborer, it's 445 Monday morning and I'm sitting at my computer after teaching four services yesterday. As tired as I am, I could not sleep. I felt the Lord was speaking to me about the future of Calvary Chapel, and I would like to share it with you. In history, every great movement of God began with the people seeking God with their whole hearts, not half-hearted, and thus receiving the blessings of God on that movement. In the book of Judges, Israel saw the spiritual rise and decline of the nation during that period of history. Seeking the Lord, they were blessed. Forsaking the Lord, they went into captivity. I fear that we might fall into the same pattern. The history of King Uzziah is recorded in 2 Chronicles 26.5, the verse we just read. And he quotes it. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. I'm concerned when I read Paul's warning to the Galatians where he asked, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 3, 1 through 3. The success of Calvary Chapel can only be attributed to the fact that it was begun in the Spirit when J. Edwin Orr, an expert in the study of the history of revivals in the church, heard about Calvary Chapel. He came down to study this revival and concluded, quote, It was the Spirit of God working through the Word of God, transforming the lives of the people of God. He goes on, Back then, we were seeking to be led and controlled by the Spirit of God. Today, it seems to me that we are now seeking to be led by gifted men to share their ideas of church growth. When we read of the phenomenal growth of the church in Acts 2, 42 and 47, we find that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. I see this as the four legs on the table. Praising God, and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I find it a little disturbing that we are scheduling pastors' conferences with featured speakers. Men who are reformed in their theology and doctrinally cessationalists believing that all the gifts of the Spirit are no longer valid for today. That men like this can teach us how to develop the church through worldly wisdom and that we no longer need total dependence on the Holy Spirit. 
I'm not suggesting that they are not true believers in Jesus Christ and sincere and loving brothers in Christ, but I do disagree with some of their doctrinal positions. I believe we have many gifted men in our own fellowship, and it's not necessary to feature other men outside Calvary Chapel to instruct us about how to improve our ministry. <laughs> I would like to see our next pastor's conference, and this would, be, would have been 2013, concentrate on the place of the Holy Spirit to lead us back to a full reliance on His work in developing our ministries. You are, this is what I loved about Pastor Chuck. He says, you are free to disagree with me. <laughs> and you are also free to seek fellowship with ministries other than Calvary Chapel. I'll never forget at one pastor's conference in California that I attended, this is many, many years ago. He said, you know, um, I know that, you know, I, I want you to know that if you don't agree with, and he was very specific, things like the pre-tribulation rapture, the gifts of the Spirit, and the list was, you know, pretty much what the Calvary Chapel distinctives are. Um, you can leave. You know, go away. Go, don't go away mad, just go away. <laughs> just go away. He goes on to say, lastly, large church numbers has never been our goal. But it's of utmost importance to be true to the Word, to be led by the Holy Spirit, and to be unified in our faith. And then he signs it this way, love in Christ from the grumpy old fossil Chuck Smith. Um, you know, I only had really the, the privilege of meeting and talking with Pastor Chuck on a couple of occasions, but for those who were really close with him uh, to a man, they would always talk about just his, his sincerity and his humility. I mean, he was just the real deal. And uh, I share this because it seems that Pastor Chuck's reference to Uzziah was a word fitly spoken. We're witnessing today this getting away, perfecting in the flesh the work that God began in the Spirit. And we're seeing it not just in the Calvary Chapel movement, but also in the church as a whole. And it's really heartbreaking. Well, let's move on. We were first introduced to Uzziah back in 1 Kings 15, and actually... In Kings, his name is recorded as Azariah, but it's one and the same with Uzziah. Uzziah was yet another one of the nine good kings who did right in the sight of the Lord, but is, he's also one of the eight of the nine that sinned in the end. And Uzziah's sin, as we're about to see, was one of his own self-promotion. He became proud and lifted up, became very arrogant as king, and in so doing, he usurped the role of the priest. His father taught us a lesson about meddling to our own peril, and this king, Uzziah, teaches us about the sin of self-promotion. The life of King Uzziah is a study of a great king who had a very tragic end. He started out as a great and wise king, so much so he's mentioned in the book of Isaiah as being sorely missed when he died after his reign of 52 years. And it seems that Isaiah the prophet was greatly discouraged by the tragic death of Uzziah, which forced him to look to the Lord, is recorded in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. One commentator of this noted, when Isaiah wrote 
that he was called in the year King Uzziah died, he said a lot. It is to say, in the year a great and wise king died. But it's also to say, in the year a great and wise king who had a tragic end died. Isaiah had great reason to be discouraged and disillusioned at the death of King Uzziah because a great king had passed away and because his life ended tragically. Yet despite it all, he saw the enthroned Lord God who was greater than any earthly king. Verse 6, Now he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jebnah, and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Gur Baal, and against the Meunites. Also, verse 8, the Ammonites brought tribute to, Isaiah, to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the corner buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. Also, he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Kind of a down-to-earth guy. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies according to the number of their role as prepared by Jeiel the scribe and Maaseiah the officer under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. And under their authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Then Uzziah prepared for them, for the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stones. And he made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men, to be on the towers and on the corners, to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide. And here's why. For he was marvelously helped till he became strong. From where did his help come? It came from the Lord. So here again, we have another good king that God blesses abundantly. And we're told that his fame had spread far and wide. And we're also told that God's the one who had marvelously helped him to the point that he became strong in himself. And tragically, as we're about to see next, this good king's heart will be lifted up in pride and it will ultimately lead to his destruction. Verse 16, and here it is. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. And here's how he did it. By entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. That's a no-no. Only the priest does that. He's not a priest. He's a king. And he takes it upon himself as king to do that which only the priest was to do in the temple. In this verse, we have what I would argue is one of the most important lessons that we can learn concerning God prospering us. And I'll explain why I say that. Prosperity has the propensity to make us proud and lift it up. And this is exactly what happened to Uzziah. God had blessed his reign. His fame is far and wide. He is so blessed. God has blessed him exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything you can imagine. Makes him strong. And then he becomes 
puffed up. It is my belief, and it's been my own personal experience, that the temptation in adversity is nothing like the temptation in prosperity. It is more of a temptation during times of prosperity than it is during times of adversity. If you really think about it, it's during times of adversity that we turn to the Lord and trust in the Lord. And during times of prosperity, we tend to think, hey, I, I got this. I got this. I've, I've got resources now. I have options now. I mean, when you don't have next month's rent, you've got to trust the Lord, right? When you have money in the bank, it's kind of like, and your prayer life shows it. When things are good, what's your prayer life like? Lord, bless me, bless this, bless that, bless them. Praise the Lord. During prosperity, let adversity strike. Oh, Lord! Oh, Lord, my God! Who is like unto you, O oh Lord, creator of the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is? <laughs> Ecclesiastes 7.14. Very interesting. Solomon writes, During times of prosperity, enjoy. Don't apologize for it. Don't feel guilty about it. Enjoy it. God's blessing you. Praise the Lord. But when, I wish it said if, when adversity strikes, when, not if, adversity strikes, stop and consider and realize that God gives one as well as the other. One translation renders it, God brings one alongside the other, both prosperity and adversity. And here's why he does it so that man can discover nothing about his future. Translated, so that man has to trust the Lord. See what happens in prosperity, and this is the great temptation, the great test, the great trial that comes packaged with prosperity is you can trust in what you have instead of trusting in the Lord. You can trust in yourself, in your own strength, in your own savvy. You don't have to trust the Lord. G. Campbell Morgan, so good. Listen to what he says. The history of men affords persistent witness to the subtle perils which are created by prosperity. More men are blasted by it than by adversity. Prosperity always puts the soul in danger of pride, of the heart lifted up, and pride ever goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. By the way, did you catch that delineation between a haughty spirit and pride? The proverb says that the haughty spirit comes before the fall, but it's pride that actually goes before destruction. The fall is not synonymous with the destruction. See, the haughty, cocky attitude is where it starts. You start thinking, hey, God's blessing me and must be something about me that, you know, God thinks is special. <laughs> it reminds me of a book that we had when the boys were little that I would read to them. And it was called, God Made You Special. And Elias thought it said, God made you a pretzel. <laughs> no, God made you a God did not make you a pretzel. God made you special. But what we start thinking is, is that, you know, it has something to do with us. Gail Irwin shares a really interesting story about a pastor that was being interviewed. His ministry was really being blessed. And the church was just growing and so he's being interviewed, and they ask him, 
what is the secret to your success? And Gail Irwin said to himself, if he says anything but it's the grace of God, he's done. And sadly, his answer was something other than it was just the Lord. It was just the grace of God. And it was within one year that that ministry fell apart. You know, this is a, a, a sobering study for me personally, and I think what would be deemed for obvious reasons. I'm very careful. God has truly blessed this amazing church and this beautiful building. This is all because of the grace of God. And early on, the Lord made it very clear to me that he was going to do it in such a way so that even if I wanted to, I could not take the credit for it. This is just the grace of God. This is a miracle from the mighty hand of God. Well, surely, Pastor, you had something to do with it. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't even say that. My flesh is fully capable of going there. I don't need your help taking me there. I'm very keenly aware of the dangers of thinking, well, surely God's blessing you because, I mean, come on, you know? That is the beginning of the end. F.B. Meyer had this to say. He concurs with Morgan. He says, God cannot trust some of us with prosperity and success because our nature could not stand them. We must tug at the oar instead of spreading the sail because we have not enough ballast. It's a great metaphor. God just knows. You know, we always quote 1 Corinthians 10, 13 in the context of adversity. You know, God won't give you more than you can handle. You know, God will not test you or try you or tempt you above that which you are able but with the trial, with the temptation, with the test, he'll provide a way of escape so that you can bear up under it. And that's where we get that saying, God won't give you more than you can handle. And that's true. God knows where that point is. God knows what we're able to bear up under and he won't give us more adversity then we can bear up under. But did you ever think that it goes the other way too? God won't give you more prosperity than you can handle either. And God knows, and it's different for all of us, God knows how much we can bear up under, whether it's adversity on this side or prosperity on this side. Verse 17, So, Azariah the priest went in after him. Here now Uzziah has forced himself into the temple. He's the king. He's taken on the role as a priest. And so Azariah the priest goes in after him. And with him were 80 priests of the Lord, <laughs> valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah became furious. And he had a censer in his hand, to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. This is bad, especially because they're still in the temple. Leprosy could not be in the temple. Leprosy is a type of sin, by the way. And verse 20, Azariah, the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> In other words, he's like, get me out of here. <laughs> well, now you get it. Because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt 
in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. As I was thinking about what happened to Uzziah, it struck me that he could have repented and none of this would have happened. But he didn't. By the time he realizes the seriousness of his transgression, that God was judging him for what he had done, it's too late. And he knows it. He knows it. And now this good king, his reign of 52 years, will come to an end as a leper isolated for the rest of his life. And is that not an apt description of what sin does? Sin isolates us. Leprosy, a type of sin. And he's isolated for the rest of his life, and he'll never again be able to step foot into the temple. Verse 22, now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from first to last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote, So Uzziah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial which belonged to the kings, for they said, He is a leper. <laughs> then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. And that's going to be, Lord willing, next week. So the chapter ends with, this tragic end to Uzziah's life. And it's interesting because this sin of pride at the end of his life would mar all the good he did in his life. In other words, that's what he's going to be remembered for. That's what's going to be on his tombstone, if you will. We just read it. He was buried, he died, for he was a leper. Here lies King Uzziah, reigned 52 years, he died a leper. Wow! That's all we're going to remember of this good king? Is that he died a leper? It's hard to imagine that such a good king who did such good when he was young would ruin everything when he's old. To me, this speaks to the paramount importance of finishing well. Running the race, as Paul, writing to Timothy, said, I have, I have finished the race. I have finished well, and now there awaits for me a crown of righteousness. And by the way, to all of those who long for His appearing, all of those who want the Lord to come back, are watching for the Lord to come back, long for the Lord to come back. There's a crown for that. I didn't say there's an app for that. I said there's a crown. I, that, I know what you were thinking. I was looking at you. And anyway. You know, some of us have been walking with the Lord for a long time. And that is when, in some cases, we're the most vulnerable, like King Uzziah. And I want to I want to close with Charles Spurgeon because he sums this up beautifully. Listen to what he says. I have lived long enough to observe that the greatest faults that are ever committed by professedly Christian men are not committed by young people. Most painful is it to me to remember that the worst cases of backsliding and apostasy that I have ever seen in this church have been by old men and middle-aged men, not by young people. For somehow or other, the young people, if they are truly taught of God, know their weaknesses, and so they cry to God for help. But it often happens that more experienced people begin to think that they are not likely to fall 
into the faults and follies of the young. And I care not how old a man may be, even if seven centuries have passed over his head, if he, and here it is, listen to this, if he began to trust in himself, he would be a fool, and soon he would have a grievous fall. You know what happens? You've been walking with the Lord for a number of years. You start resting on your laurels. You start thinking, yeah, I've you know, been walking with the Lord for a long time. And here's the, the young believer, relatively speaking, that is very aware of his weaknesses. And he puts the guard up. But when you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you tend to let your guard down. Yeah. Yeah, back in my day, you know. <laughs> and we begin to trust in ourselves and our tenor in the Lord. And this is what Uzziah had done. Well, next week, great news, really good king, the only one of the nine good kings who didn't sin in the end. I had to end on that note. <laughs> Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Loving Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word and especially these details that we have in these two chapters that we looked at tonight. What a needful warning for us. What a needful word for us to heed. Lord, I pray that we would learn from this, take from this, those truths, those lessons, and apply them to our lives, that we would guard our hearts against the destruction that comes from pride and arrogance and haughtiness. Lord, that we would never be numbered amongst those who, it could be said, they trust in themselves, in their own strength that we would be those who trust only in you. In Jesus' name, amen.